Raylan here. I've got another really amazing interview for you today. I'm so excited about this one. I've got Anna Marsh with me here, and she has had a long journey with chronic fatigue syndrome. And although she is still on her health journey, she's made a ton of progress. She's about 75% of the way recovered, and she has just learned so much from her experience with this and just has a lot of great insights uh, to health uh, uh, in general. So I'm just really excited to bring her on the channel today. So thank you so much, Anna, for doing this today. No, thank you. I'm really excited to speak with you and also just really excited to share so many of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Can you tell us a bit about yourself, where you are in the world and so forth? So I'm, I'm South African, which you may or may not pick up with the accent. Sometimes people don't know <laughs> what my accent is, but I'm originally from South Africa, but I live now in the UK. So I moved here about 13 years ago. Um, so I grew up in South Africa, currently living in the UK. Is it as rainy over there as it is here in San Francisco? <laughs> um, we've actually had beautiful autumn weather. We've had some lovely sunny days. I live by the beach. So my favorite thing is like walking on the beach on a beautiful sunny day when the water is nice and blue. And we've had a lot of that recently, which has been amazing. Oh, that's so great to hear. A little envious, but happy for you. All right. So excited to dive into your health journey. So can you take us back a bit? Tell us about that. Yeah, so I think the best place to start is probably by mentioning that I had fatigue as a child. So I was about nine years old. I remember I was sitting at the kitchen table one evening doing my homework and I just lay down on the floor and I just said, I can't, you know, I just, I just can't do this anymore. I'm too tired. And that kind of just persisted in terms of me just feeling really low. And I guess as a nine year old child, it's kind of difficult to really express how you're feeling and nobody really knew what was wrong with me. And I saw various doctors. One of the doctors at the time said that he thought that I was depressed. Um, my parents were going through a divorce at the time. So I think there was a lot of emotional stress in the household. And then I eventually saw a specialist who diagnosed me with nephritis, which is inflammation of the kidneys, rightly or wrongly. And I was put on lots of different medications. I had to take time off school. And it took about six months until I started to come back to my old self. I then relapsed the, a year later, and then it took a little bit more time for me to feel better again. And then I was fine. No problems whatsoever for the rest of my teenage years, into my 20s, until I eventually moved to the UK, which I mentioned in 2008. And I think that's where, for me, things really started to unravel. I can see now in hindsight that what happened was I got off the plane at Heathrow, hit the ground running, and I didn't stop running until eventually my body made me stop, which was ultimately where you know, all the symptoms kind of came to a head and um, I could no longer continue with life the way that it was before. But that process probably took about eight years um, until I really started to notice a change in my body was just slowing down, almost like trying to drive with the handbrake up. Everything was just harder. It felt like, you know, the gears weren't really turning. Um, and then there was kind of like a slow decline over the next sort of four years um, until I really hit rock bottom with my symptoms. This had a, it sounds like this had a very slow, gradual onset for you. And then what did it look like when things really kind of got worse quickly? Was it, you know, as an overnight, like some people can tell you the date that it happened mm -hmm. or was it still more of a slow progression? What did that look like? Yeah. So I think what I noticed is um, I was actually listening to one of your interviews. I think it was with Nick potentially. And he said he had been on a trip. And when he came back from that trip, he felt really unwell. And I think you expressed sort of the same in your book. Mm -hmm. um, and that year, it was 2016. And I, it was a busy year. Actually, I got married. I bought a house with my husband. There was a lot of good stress, but there was also a lot of other stresses, like I was traveling a lot for work. I was doing a lot of conferences. There was jet lag. And I was also kind of pushing myself like hard with my training. So there was just like a lot of things stacking up. And I went to Japan for a short trip for a business mastermind. And I hated Japan. <laughs> no offense to Japan, but it was just... <laughs> 
It was the middle of Tokyo. It was just no nature, really busy, really hectic, no fresh food. It just wasn't my jam. And I just really didn't enjoy the trip at all. It was quite fast paced, lots of jet lag. I came back. And then I just remember after that, I was waking up in the morning and I just didn't feel like myself anymore. So I was, um, I'm usually actually a very self-motivated person, a very driven person. I can I focus very well. I drive myself forward very well. And I felt like all of that was gone. I just didn't have the energy. I didn't have the focus. I didn't have the drive. And, um, what I started to notice, I guess the biggest symptom for me is like a, a foggy head, or I guess what people call brain fog. I think that different people experience brain fog differently. It wasn't that I was forgetful or forgetting things or struggling to concentrate, but it was just like there was cotton wool permanently in my brain. That's how it felt. I could just have this kind of fuzziness and fogginess in my brain. And a lot of pain. So pain, especially kind of around my neck and my shoulders, which I thought was, oh, I'm just training a bit too hard at the gym. Um, probably shouldn't do so much upper body work. Probably just need to stretch more. But it was sort of chronic pain that I was just sort of brushing under the carpet because I just wanted to keep living my life the way that I was living it. And so I'd say those symptoms kind of waxed and waned a bit. I, I wasn't completely ignoring them by any means, but I think the things that I was trying to do were not really getting to the root of the problem. So I was kind of going through phases of trying different things, making different adjustments, and that kind of fluctuated. You know, I'd feel good for a bit, I'd feel bad for a bit, I'd feel good for a bit, I'd feel bad for a bit. And then eventually at the beginning of 2019, I went to Sri Lanka to do a 200 hour yoga teacher training. And when I came back from that trip and then I tried to reintegrate and just pick up life where I had left it off, my body was just, no, that's enough. <laughs> you, we can't continue the way that you have done before. And a big thing for me was the post exertional malaise. So. I'd been really into fitness. I'd love to work out, love to train a lot. And I had noticed previously, if I did like a big day at the gym training quite hard, I would really get that brain fog and post-exertional malaise. And then when I came back from the yoga teacher training, because all I'd done was yoga and no gym work for that time. And I went back to the gym and I tried to do pick up on my workouts and what I had done before. Um, it just completely threw my nervous system and I almost felt like I was having a panic attack or anxiety post-workout. That was sort of the, the extent of my post-exertional malaise. So what were you thinking through all of this? So, yeah, good question. Really good question. Um, so, I mean, I, I come from a, I have a health background, like my, my career is in health. So, it's not that I was completely in the dark. I knew something was wrong. Um, but I guess I couldn't see the bigger picture. I can't see, you know, if I knew now what I knew then, I think the trajectory of everything would have been very different. But at the time, I guess I was, I was trying to do more on the symptom level to support my body instead of look at the bigger picture of my life mm. and who I was and how I was showing up as a person and how ultimately that was contributing to what I believe was a very dysregulated nervous system. So, you know, I was like thinking, oh, I need to, you know, I need to work on my digestive health. And I did, and it did help. But I felt like all I did all these little things that made a little difference, but I really needed to get to the root of what was really going on. Yeah, I'm always curious. So sometimes we have, is it, you know, an element of denial, or maybe we're just so busy, and we just don't even have the time mm -hmm. to really invest. Like, we just, I think a lot of us get in the state of survival mode, like, I still have to work, I still have to do everything. It's just getting yourself up, getting through the day. And then we just yeah. kind of get worse and worse because we're not paying attention or not as much as attention as we should be to what's happening in our body. Yeah. And I think that's a really important observation is because I always thought I was connected to my body. You know, I was into fitness, um, I practiced yoga. I was, you know, dabbled in meditation. I thought that I had a connection to my body, but what I also had was a lot of unhelpful coping mechanisms to deal with being in that survival mode. 
And if anybody had asked me four years ago, are you an anxious person? Do you suffer from anxiety? I would have said, no, no way. I'm not an anxious person. But my anxiety just manifested in overworking, overachieving, um, you know, pushing myself really hard in all kind of aspects of my life so that there was no space actually to feel what was going on below the surface. And the chronic fatigue, it forced me to stop because I had no choice but to lie down and rest. And that was really, really hard at first because all of a sudden there was a space which was opened for all the unprocessed emotions to come to the surface. And it took, it took a really long time for me to adjust to that slower pace of life. Um, still probably a little bit hard at times now, I'm sure. And I think also with the idea of denial, um, denial is one of the first stages of grief. And I think my first year when I came back from that yoga teacher training and I really, something was most definitely wrong at that point. I'd call that my rock bottom. I probably lived that whole year in denial because denial is self-protective. Denial stops us from feeling the extent of our loss. And there, there was so much that I was losing, even if it, if it was just an identity that I had or, you know, the loss of the things that I was, I loved to be able to do. I'm sure, you know, the listeners will resonate with all the loss that comes with having a chronic condition. And being in denial just kind of allows you to drip feed <laughs> some of that, that sort of loss, like coming to terms with that loss over time. So it's, it's self-protective. We just don't want to stay and live there for too long. Yeah, that's such a good point. And it's something that I don't know that we talk about enough is that I know, I know all of us who go through it feel it, but that element of grief, it is mm-hmm. massive because you have so much stripped away from you so quickly. It's, it, and it, it, you're so focused on fixing your health that most of us aren't even putting in any attention into dealing with that. And even with our health, like I've read, you've said, and I know I had a similar experience that, you know, you were on the outside, I'm sure everyone and yourself included thought you were taking really good care of yourself. You ate well, you Mm -hmm. exercised, you know, you had all these wonderful things in your life, but most of us neglect our brain and our mind and our nervous system. And that doesn't even occur to us when we think about self-care. So yeah, it's just a mix of all these different things going on and we have to unlearn and relearn. (laughs) Yeah. And I think one of the biggest mistakes I made in my first year of feeling unwell was that very strong achiever part of me. I put her in charge of my recovery. So she went in like all guns blazing into like, how am I going to fix this and achieve, achieve at my recovery. And, um, I think you've, express something similar in your book. And I guess that was also just a form of denial because it was sort of keeping me occupied by keeping the sort of inner achiever part in what I would always say, like in the, it's, it's the inner achiever is driving the bus. It's the one that's sort of, you know, taking charge of the situation and driving everything forward. But that's what I'd done my whole life. And it was that pattern that had kind of led me down this road in the first place. This is one of the many reasons I love doing these interviews because I learn so much and I get so many insights and I, you know, I've reflected on my own journey so much. I feel like there's nothing left to figure out, but you know, when I first became really sick and I eventually found a really good doctor and he explained a bit that I, me running myself into the ground and the stress and the overachiever is kind of what got me in trouble. But then, you know, well-meaning he said, but that same part of your personality is what's going to get you out of this. So it just fed that. I'm like, okay, I have Mm -hmm. to go at this guns blazing and give it my all and do 10 different things at once trying to recover and take every supplement that's out there. And it's, yeah, it's not breaking you out of that cycle, that pattern of what might have contributed to the health problems to start with. So did you start seeing doctors at some point? What did that look like? Um, so I think it's quite unique here in the UK because we have free healthcare through the NHS, but it's also, I felt very resistant to them being able to actually help me get better from the get go, just from where I stand in my own profession. I was like maybe a little bit self-righteous and like, I know more than them. They're not going to be able to help me. I'm not going to them for help, but I did go to the doctor. I actually had a, um, from the NHS website, I had the symptoms for chronic fatigue syndrome printed out and I took that in with me to the appointment. And I said, I think 
I have this. And it was actually, it was quite a profound experience because I ugly cried in the doctor's office. It was kind of an important moment, I think, because it was me actually saying out loud, there really is a problem here and I need help. And it was also quite, I felt very, very vulnerable at the time. And as I'm sure many of your listeners will resonate, they ran a whole bunch of tests, everything came back normal. And then at that point of time, in time, uh, I was just like abandoned ship. And I think that I just didn't have the inner strength to go back and to continue to pursue the process of diagnosis. So I actually started working with a friend of mine who's based in San Francisco. Um, her name is Dr. Lacey Chittle. Uh, she is a functional medicine practitioner. I think her doctorate is in physiotherapy, so she's not um, a, a medical doctor, I think, as you would say. And she, I had met her at a conference when I was doing my functional medicine training, and we had always just stayed connected. We had one of those kind of soul connections. And she has a very powerful story of having multiple autoimmune conditions and then recovering. So she was the best person I knew who could help me at the time. And we started working together and that was a very insightful process for me also as a practitioner, just to learn from her and see how she did things with people in my position. And I learned a lot from that experience. And, and we worked on, we did some, we didn't actually do that much testing, but we did, um, we did supplements. We did basic things like blood sugar monitoring further down the line. I did some more testing and I do believe that all of that stuff has its place. But I also believe that you cannot out supplement your lifestyle and you cannot out supplement nervous system dysregulation and you cannot supplement. It doesn't compensate for a bad routine and it doesn't compensate for if you're still exercising really inappropriately for where you are in with your body and your journey. So I think those are some other lessons that I had to learn along the way. So before we dive into you know some of the things that you started doing that were helping you, just when you were at your worst with this, what was your average day or weeks looking like? Um, what were some of your symptoms? So I would say, I think it's difficult to kind of classify, but I would probably say I, I was never so bad. I was probably more on the milder side. Um, the biggest thing for me is was post-exertional malaise. And so like in a week, I would say... I never stopped working, but sometimes I would be working and I felt, you know, really awful with the, you know, brain fog and muscle pain and um, fatigue. And so it's, I guess it's easier for me because I run my own business. I'm fairly flexible in terms of what, how much I do or don't do. And I can take rest in the day and I work from home. So all of those things made it a cheap um easier to achieve sort of keeping things ticking over. But I've always kind of reflected back on that and thought, should I just have taken time off just to fully focus on me and my recovery? And, you know, we'll never know the answer to that. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's, I think it's hard for me to answer that question because I, I think I also just continue to push through quite a bit and rightly or wrongly, I don't know, but I, I'd say, the quality of life, even though maybe on the outside, I was still doing a lot of things. The quality of life was poor. Like I didn't, I didn't feel good in myself. An interesting thing. Uh, I, this MECFS has such a large spectrum, uh, you know, in, in severity. And I, I've said before, I, I really dislike the term mild CFS. I get that we mm. need to quantify, you know, somehow um, where people are with this, but because you know, I, I started out with what was probably classified as moderate for the first couple of years, but then I was mi mild for years. And mm. on the other side, it probably looked like my life was really quite good and normal, but every single day was a struggle. I never had not once in all those years, a 24 hour period where I just felt good. There wasn't one single mm -hmm. day where I wasn't always, it was like this challenge to get through the day. Like, where am I going to put my rest in? Where am I going to get the naps in? What's going to be over too overstimulating? Who am I going to have to lie to or try and hide my condition from? And so I appreciate um, these stories as well, because even at the mild stage, it's devastating to your life and can cause severe depression and all sorts of, of issues. So I, I, um, I thank you for talking about this. Yeah. And I think also like, quote, quote, like healthy people have 
can often move through life never actually feeling good in themselves. You know, mm. uh, my husband, for example, I, I always tell him he complains that he's tired and headachy and achy mm. and not feeling good more than I do. And, you know, I, I kind of see him and how he treats his body and maybe how he could eat a bit better and all of these things. And I just think you're not thriving either. And so I think from someone who also has a history of like shove everything down, don't feel, keep on pushing. Um, it's kind of easy to keep on operating in, in operating in your life, but you're not really feeling good. And, and then every now and again, it kind of all comes to a head and then the tears come and you have to take a day in bed. And I think, um, it, it, I think that's, yeah, where it does make the classification difficult because you just don't know how much someone is tolerating and how much someone is pushing through. So how did you eventually start to get some insight on what you needed to recover? Um, I think it was a slow process. So working working with Lacey um, and doing a few things there actually really did make a big difference in a short space of time. I've talked about it quite a lot on my social media, so I won't talk about it in too much detail now. But um, a big thing for me was just blood sugar control. I, I didn't realize that even though I was eating a healthy diet, it wasn't a diet which was appropriate for me. And my blood sugar was too high. And so that was something that I addressed really quickly that um, made a big difference in terms of the amount of pain I was experiencing. Um, And I think pulling back in terms of what I was doing, I had to cancel my gym membership. I had to say goodbye to any kind of resistance training. Um, You know, I was still able to do some yoga and I was still able to do some walking but, you know, I had to be careful about how much I did. And I remember when I canceled my gym membership and I was like, I'm just going to make yoga my new thing. And then I just pushed myself really hard in the yoga practice and it, it wasn't a good idea. So it was really about scaling, scaling that back. So I'd say the blood sugar regulation was a big thing for me. Some carefully chosen supplements to support inflammation in my body was really helpful. Um, and then starting to scale back on what I was actually asking my body to do each day was helpful as well. And I would say within about six months, I was starting to do some like teeny tiny little body weight workouts. And I was starting to do a little bit of swimming and, you know, things were actually going kind of well. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm getting out of this. And then at the end of that first year, I had a massive personal stressor and everything just came crashing down. So my second year was actually the hardest year because I had been making all this progress and then my nervous system just really went into freeze mode. Everything kind of shut down. And it was also when we went into lockdown here, well, when the whole world went into lockdown. And I guess everybody was grieving at that time. And it was at that point that I realized, oh my gosh, I've actually been in this grief cycle for the past year And there was a huge amount of emotional processing I needed to do. So I was kind of thawing myself out of this nervous system freeze and kind of processing my grief and just generally navigating the world at that time. Um, And it was it was actually, I was able to do less than I was the previous year. So I had this massive setback and I feel like now I'm only starting to kind of get back to where I was before. It's, it's interesting. I, I don't know if you've noticed the same, but it feels like we're, there's a lot more awareness around the role of the autonomic nervous system. Whereas I didn't mm-hmm. used to hear a lot of talk about that years ago when I first got sick. It, it was 2008 for me as well when this started and I wasn't hearing really anything about it, but you know, we're starting to get that we, our body needs to be in that relaxed um, parasympathetic state so that it can heal and it can thrive. And you've been mentioning, you know, regulating your nervous system. So what does that look like for you? How do you do that in your daily life? Yeah, I think that's something really great for us to touch on because it was game changing for me. And I think a lot of people, it is starting to become more popular now and more people are talking about it, which is so good. So at the beginning of this year, I signed up to a course to become a trauma-informed practitioner, just so I could be more trauma-informed in the work that I do. And... um 
that was really kind of eye opening for me as I started to understand more about the nervous system and it helped me also understand what had been going on in my body. And I'm someone who likes to understand things and it's, it's more powerful for me if I understand something that I can understand what I need to do to work with it. So, um, kind of very briefly is what happens in freeze is that the freeze is really just the, the outcome when there has been too much too much stimulation going on for too long and the body shuts down as a mechanism for coping. And I guess it's really important for people to understand that that's intelligence. The body is there, it's protecting you and you have to work with that response in order to overcome it. So you can't rush yourself out of freeze. You can't push yourself out of freeze. You can't achieve yourself out of freeze. You have to really, um, I guess, cultivate this idea of like gentle thawing. Um, and it sounds very, very simple, but I would say maybe like if I give like the top three things that I found beneficial are, um, number one, just connecting to my body. So as I said, I thought I was connected before, but I actually realizing now what it means to be connected. And so something I do myself and something I ask my clients to do is just, Take a moment, pause, scan your body and notice a sensation. And so what people will normally do in that case is they go to where is their pain? Where is their discomfort? Where is their ache? Where is it something negative? And that's fine. Um, but I also encourage people to ask where is their spaciousness? Where is their openness? Where is their calm? Where is their peace? What feels good? So it's being able to identify or get more attuned to what's going on in the body. And also identify the emotion. So what are you feeling at this moment in time? So you're looking for a sensation and an emotion. And it's it's really just about checking in because the nervous system, I, I often say to my clients, it's like it's like a little child. It just wants you to see it. It just wants you to be like, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? And also not be told you're wrong for being achy today or you're wrong for being angry today. It's just acknowledging what's there. So I think that's just a really simple, easy thing that's worked really well for me and just doing that several times a day. Uh, the other thing is breathing. So simple. Again, we all breathe, but sometimes we don't always pay attention to how we breathe. So I've found that like when I'm working, because now I'm more in tune and connected to how my body's feeling, I can tell when I'm kind of getting like quite wound up. And then when I notice that, I'll use my breath to just bring me back down again. So instead of what I probably would have done pre-CFS was just like wind up, wind up, wind up throughout the whole day and then be like buzzing, it's now there's like a little wind and then a settle and a little wind and then a settle. And actually those winds and settle, winds and settle, it's like training a muscle in the gym. It's like the more you practice settling your system, the better you get at it. And over time, that's what builds your resilience. So noticing what's in the body and then having tools to settle are really important. And then the final thing I just say is um, connecting to joy and gratitude and spending time in nature. So our nervous system is calibrated to whatever experiences it's exposed to. So if you're just sitting in your office in front of your screen feeling stressed all the time, that's what your nervous system is calibrating to. But if you're doing things that you love, spending time with people that you love, cuddling your puppy or um, swimming in the ocean or just whatever it is that you love to do, the more of that that's in your life, your nervous system is calibrating to that and it feels good and spacious and safe. I love all of that so much. That was so incredibly well said. And I love that wind settle a thought throughout the day. I think so many of us ha are conditioned to or have the habit of we just wind ourselves up all day long and don't mm. ever take a moment. And then the day's finally over and we have a giant glass of wine or something to just kind of like, oh, I made it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's not really dealing with anything or really helping anything. It's such an interesting thing too about the fight, flight and freeze uh, because we heard about fight or flight for years, but now we're having mm -hmm. more understanding about this freeze response. And it makes so much sense to me 
anyways, because for many of us, myself included, you know, I was going along seemingly healthy and then it was like my body just shut down. And then I go and get every test imaginable and they're all coming back saying that my body is fine, but yet I can't barely sit up, you know? So it just, it makes, it makes so much sense. Yeah. And I think another, just what I, how I've heard this described, which was really nice is if you think of the, the sympathetic system, which is your fight or flight, like a rocket ship, it's like that wind up, like take off huge amount of energy and the freeze is there to sort of, and it's like a big parachute that's coming down on the rocket ship and trying to pull it back down to earth. It's trying to contain that energy. And even though the freeze is frozen. It's like pulling the rocket ship down. There is so much energy actually underneath. And that's that like tired, but wired feeling. And it's, um, it's the equivalent of like having the handbrake up, but your foot flat on the gas. So often we can be in freeze, but we could also feel like there's huge amounts of activation in the body. Um, and I, I don't know if, if this was your experience, but sometimes I feel like my whole body is tingling and my whole body is buzzing but I still just feel so tired. Um, and that's just a lot of that bound up. Well, in, in my mind, that's just a lot of that bound up sympathetic energy that's being like held in place by the freeze response. That is fascinating. That really helps me understand things a lot better. It, it definitely resonates with my experience. That sounds bang on. So what are you, where are you at now with your health journey? Are you working? Because you've said you are at about 75% ish recovery. Are you working for a hundred percent? Are there new things you're trying? What does that look like? So I would say like, I don't work full time, but I never want to work full time. <laughs> so that's also part of the reason why. And my, I say my symptoms are still a little bit up and down. I find that they are very much dependent on where I am in my cycle. So that's my hormonal cycle. So earlier in my cycle, I can be more tired. And later in my cycle, I have more energy. So we're recording this now in the best time of my cycle. And I've been on the go since first thing this morning, like doing you know, various different pieces, uh, different things. And I, I say, I feel like a normal human being, but there may be times in different times in my cycle where my capacity or I would say window of tolerance is not as great. So I would say there are times when I almost feel like a normal human. And then there are times when I feel less of a normal human. And I think that's also quite hard because it's like, oh, everything's great. I feel amazing. And then my cycle comes. I'm like, I'm never going to get better again. So you are on these like highs and lows. And I'd say the biggest nut I still have to crack is exercise. It's always been such a passion of mine. I've, it's also been a huge coping mechanism for stress, admittedly as well. And I love to be outdoors. I love to do things. I love to use my body in all sorts of different ways. So it's something that like, I really want. It's probably the biggest thing that I want is just to be able to do what I want to do with my body without limitation. Like just decide I'm going to go on a hike and not have to worry that I might not feel good afterwards or to go swimming in the sea and not have to worry about what else I've got to do in the day. So I can do those things. I can, I can hike and I can swim and sometimes I feel okay. And sometimes I don't. So I'm still working on that. The hormone piece is a big one. And I know that you have learned a lot about this over the years uh, and it's hard to cover in, in a short amount of time, but I get a lot of questions about managing hormones, how they're impacting health. You know, what, it, can you share just a little bit of the insight that you've learned about that and how it impacts how you're feeling? Yeah, so I would say as women, we are naturally, we naturally have our hormones fluctuating throughout the month if we're, if we're cycling. Obviously, you know, after menopause, we no longer have those fluctuations anymore. So it's normal for even healthy women to maybe feel a little bit different at different times of the month. But how I like to think of this is that your hormones are the volume control on what else is going on. So in a condition like CFS, whatever is going on under the hood is being turned up or turned down, depending on where you are in your cycle. And sometimes women do have hormonal imbalances and we do need to work with them and modulate them to improve health outcomes. But I think if, in terms of just CFS and then hormones, it's very much, I think, being attuned to the different phases of your cycle and how that impacts your energy. 
because the body is competing for energy at different times of your cycle. So menstruation and ovulation are energetically expensive events. So if energy is prioritized to reproduction, it's not going to the brain. It's not going to the metabolic system and the places we really want it to be if we want to feel good. Have you found any things that help you during those times when your body is uh, diverting energy elsewhere? Are there things that you can do to help you through that part of your cycle or you kind of just have to ride it out? At the moment, just write it out. I was in my sort of second year of recovery, getting a lot of bad menstrual migraines. And I was having actually quite a lot of what I call menstrual flu. (laughs) So pre-menstrual flu or period flu, I just feel absolutely awful during menstruation. And there have been some things which have been really helpful for me. I'd say there are three things I did at the beginning of this year that made a difference for me. One was to take GLA, which is a, which is an omega-6 fatty acid that um, has a modulating role in inflammation. And so this I did because I did some red cell fatty acid testing and my GLA was low. And I'll say as well, when I have done red cell fatty acid testing with clients, a lot of them are coming up with low GLA. In fact, all of them are coming up with low GLA. So now I kind of just say to clients, I don't think we need to test. It's probably going to be low. You can probably just take some of this and see if it helps you or not. Um, so that was really beneficial. Um, antioxidants. So antioxidants generally are pretty good for chronic fatigue syndrome. So I was taking a multivitamin, which had a good amount of antioxidants in it, um, really, really high amounts. And then glutathione, which is one of your body's major, major antioxidants. So I started doing those three things at the beginning of the year. And they significantly improved how I was feeling across the cycle, although there still is some fluctuation, some variability, which which I kind of do need to write out. That's so helpful to know. I have people asking me a lot of questions about, about hormones, and I am just clueless. It's one of the things over these years that I have not learned much more about than I did before all this started. <laughs> uh, so thank you for sharing that. That's That's really helpful to know. So this has been quite a long journey for, for you start to finish. How do you, has this changed you or has it impacted who you are as a person or how you live your life? I would say definitely. One of my favorite sayings is to achieve something we've never achieved before. We have to become someone we've never been. And I think that is the journey of recovery is there is an identity shift that has to happen because if the the person that you were before created the conditions in your life which allowed for the manifestation of the disease, then in order to unmanifest the disease, or shall we say manifest wellness, is there needs to be a different person creating a different set of conditions. And kind of circling back to what we were saying about grief is I think part of the the grieving and the loss that comes with the diagnosis is loss of the identity of the old self. And for me, my identity was very bound up in being this achiever. It was very bound up by being this very like fit, strong, athletic woman who worked out hard and really pushed herself. And I had to really let all those parts of me go because there was just no space for them really in my recovery journey. So I'm sure a lot of people you've interviewed have said the same thing, but this is probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And at the same time, one of the most rewarding things I've ever had to do, or ever had the privilege to do, because I have learned so much about myself and um, really had the opportunity to look at a lot of my shadows and a lot of the parts that I didn't want to look at and, and integrate them more into who I am and definitely learned a whole lot about boundaries as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a horrific, hellish experience that I wouldn't wish on anyone. But the silver lining is, is that, you know, if you let it be, it can be like growth boot camp. It really can just <laughs> propel you to a whole new place in your life. And you really can come through it a much more spectacular uh, version of yourself in terms of happiness and just peace and mm-hmm. self care and um, just the way you are in the world. So, yeah. That was- yeah, I think. Being connected to what that is and, and also I think your own authenticity as well. Yes. Yes. I think you become more of who you already are. And I think you are better able to connect with people, have more empathy. I find, um, you just have a sharper 
focus on priorities. At least that's been my experience. And virtually everyone I talk to says the same, you know, you have a better, you've removed a lot of filters. I find after this process, a lot of people tell me this, like they can, a lot of the denial, you pull your head out of the sand and you might actually realize that you're not in a profession that's working for you, or maybe you're not even in a country that's a good enough dream. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's easy to get going on autopilot in our lives. And it's difficult to admit to ourselves that some things in our life aren't working. And I, I find that these sorts of experiences really open your eyes to the life that you really want to be living, which is an incredible thing. It's unfortunate that we have to go to hell and back to, to get those lessons, but <laughs> at least we get something from it. <laughs> Yeah, at least we get something. I always say it's like be- beautiful gifts wrapped up in really ugly packaging. So you, I, I always wrap up this way. I'm sure you, everyone sees this coming, but you know, for people who are in this still, I mean, like you, or who maybe they've just started, they've just been diagnosed, you, what message would you have for them or for yourself if you could go back in time? Gosh, that's actually a really difficult question to answer because I think Obviously, hindsight is twenty twenty. If I look back in time, I would just tell myself to do everything that I'm doing now. But I also feel that there is there are lessons that come from all the, the steps and the ups and downs of the journey. But I'd say if there's one thing, I'd say get curious about the nervous system and and how you can support your nervous system. Or even just a simple inquiry is, you know, how how happy and joyful do you feel in your life? If if the nervous system is and calibrating to the experiences that you're giving it. Think about the experiences you're giving your body each day. And if you really want to be calibrating to those experiences or not, that's a, I guess, a really important place to start or a really useful place to start. And I guess also just to be gentle with yourself and compassionate with yourself and to give yourself time and spaciousness to allow this all to happen because I think the resistance and the self-judgment and the self-blame just slow down the process. Well, (laughs) for people who aren't aware of you or what you do or what you offer, tell us a bit. We haven't even dove into uh, all the things that you're trained in and the services that you provide for people. So could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So I'm a study geek. (laughs) I just love learning. I love studying things. I am a bit of a science nerd. So I love going into the science of things, but I also do have like a a softer side as well. And I really just like to combine the two. I like to combine science with a little bit of like intuition and softness and embodiment work as well. So I trained initially as a nutritional therapist and then did my functional medicine training with Institute of Functional Medicine. And I guess I work in that space of just supporting people with their health. And from my experience working with clients, one of the biggest things I realized was that the stress management nervous system piece is really, really important. So I also trained as a coach and became trauma informed and did some neuro strategies and NLP training so that I could support people more on that side of things. And so I offer both to my clients, I work with people with chronic illness and stress related illnesses and just really help them find their way out of all of this. Cause I think the path is unique to all of us. Some of it we have to do alone. Sometimes we need hand holding and direction and support to shortcut the process. And, and that's what I'm available for if anybody wants that help. That's incredible. And I am so grateful to you and all the people like yourself who are out there providing support to, because we have millions of people in the world who are facing MECFS or similar conditions. And it can be such an overwhelming and scary and confusing process to go through. So yeah, I I think that's wonderful that you're out there and able to support people in this way. Um, If people wanted to find you or learn more about what you do, how would they do that? So I guess I'm most active on Instagram, which is Anna underscore Marsh underscore nutrition. And my website is annamarsh.co.uk. I do have a YouTube channel. It's nothing like yours, Raylan. It's more just like a dumping ground for everything else I've done elsewhere. Um, But I'd say Instagram on my website are probably the two best places to reach me. 
Wonderful. And of course, this will all be in the video description. I highly encourage anyone watching to click on them, take a look, check her out at a bare minimum, start following her on Instagram because uh, Anna puts out some really amazing, helpful, inspiring, uplifting stuff. And it's a, a really great addition to my life uh, seeing you come up on my feed. So yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for doing this today. You, I, I've loved every second uh, of this. I think you have so many great insights to health and happiness. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for taking the time oh. to speak to my, my subscribers. Oh, thank you just so much for the opportunity to chat. I, I just, I am so passionate about this as well. And I just love the opportunity to share what I know, whether that's the sciencey stuff or my own experience. So thank you for giving me a platform for my voice. Oh, it's absolutely my honor and my pleasure. And I'm very excited for all of you watching to let you know that there's going to be a part two to this video because Anna is um, a wealth of knowledge and expertise on the topic of hormones. And as I mentioned, this is something that people have been reaching out to me a lot, asking for me to share more about this, but I just, I am not the person to share on that, but, but Anna is one of those people. So stay tuned very, uh, not too soon after this video comes out, we'll have a part two with Anna. And if you're looking for more information about how hormones impact our health and how we can work with that, um, she'll be doing a deep dive into all of that. So yeah, thank you to everyone who is watching. Looking forward to your comments. I'm sure Anna will be happy to respond to them there as well. And thank you again, Anna. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you thank in the you. next video.